Thank you so much for the invitation. It is an honor to speak at a Chinese conference on knowledge graphs and semantic computing, two topics which are very close to my heart. I am calling in today from Berkeley, California. I'm Danny Ranicic, founder of Wikidata and founder of Wikifunctions, head of special projects at the Wikimedia Foundation. The driving vision of the Wikimedia movement is a world where everyone can share in the sum of all knowledge. We do that through our projects, the most famous one being Wikipedia and Wiktionary. But today I'm going to speak about Wikidata and Wikifunctions, our newest project, which has only started up a few weeks ago. Wikidata is an open knowledge graph that anyone can edit. It was launched in 2012, 11 years ago, and provides structured linked data and persistent identifiers for millions of topics of interest. Wikidata is entirely multilingual, as we will see in a moment, and it is used extensively by Wikipedia and many, many other projects. Companies, developers such as Google, Apple, Microsoft, Lufthansa, the BBC, and many more. Also, and in particular, by research teams all around the world. Google Scholar lists more than 26,000 research papers on top of Wikidata. Let's dive into how Wikidata looks like, but we are going to start with Wikipedia. This is the English Wikipedia article about a Chinese physicist, Lu Qijia. There is also a Chinese article about Lu Qijia. Note that the content of the two articles is actually entirely independent of each other. Sure, you will see a lot of overlap, hopefully, but if you fix or add something in the Chinese article, it won't automatically propagate to the English version or the French version, or the Indonesian version. These articles are all written independently of each other. This is Wikidata's page on Lucidia. Right on the top you see the persistent identifier Wikidata has assigned to Lucidia, her QID, Q82889814. We see structured data about her that she's a human, her picture, let's scroll, her country of citizenship, date and place of birth and death, her father, etc. We have all this structured information about Lu Shijia. But all of these things, the Suzhou prefecture, Beijing, her father, Li Guangxi, those are not just strings. Those are other items in Wikidata with their own persistent identifier, with their own QID. And because it is entirely structured, we can simply switch the language of this view from English to Chinese. And not only read it in Chinese, but also edit it in Chinese. The interface is entirely multilingual. No language is our primary language, both um, for reading and for editing it's entirely multilingual. And this not, doesn't work only in English and Chinese, but it is available in 496 languages. How many websites do you know that are available in almost 500 languages? A bit further down on the page, we can find more statements about Lu Xijia, in particularly identifiers in other knowledge bases, in authority files and other websites. This allows Wikidata to act like a modern Rosetta Stone, where you can translate from an identifier in one knowledge source to identifiers in other knowledge sources. But unlike the Rosetta Stone, we map not, we map not only between three different representations, but we connect more than 8,000 knowledge sources, authority files and catalogs with each other. Wikidata is easily the largest hub of shared identifiers on the web, allowing you to collect data from billions of pages. Wikidata describes more than 106 million items with more than one and a half billion statements. 
Wikidata is, like all our projects, driven by volunteers and we have more than 23,000 monthly contributors on Wikidata. Overall, more than half a million people contributed to Wikidata so far, a number I personally find absolutely astonishing. When I started Wikidata, I would not have believed that there are that many people in the world interested in contributing to structured data. Wikidata has seen almost 2 billion edits so far, making it by far the most edited wiki in the world, easily beating the English Wikipedia, which is double as old. Wikidata also sees about 15 million Sparkle queries every day. Sparkle is a query language for knowledge graphs. Wikidata Sparkle Endpoint has the ability to create astonishing and interactive visualizations of the Wikidata data. Unfortunately, it is also at high at risk. If you want to work with us on our Sparkle Endpoint, we could use the help. Here are some results from the Sparkle Endpoint. And mind you, this is not being done in code. These are just the results from the Wikidata Sparkle Query Server directly. Here we see paintings by Vermeer. We ask for where the painting is hosted. We ask for the geo coordinates of the host, like the museum, and then we load the picture from Wikimedia Commons and visualize all of this on top of a map from OpenStreetMaps. Just a query to Wikidata. Next query. This here is a fully interactive graph of the etymology of the English word water and its cognates, going back to Old English and eventually Proto-Indo-European, and all the other languages that derive a word from the same root. Next query. I love this one. This is an example of a federated query spanning not just the Wikidata knowledge graph, but also the one by OpenStreetMaps. So OpenStreetMaps also has a Sparkle endpoint. The query is all ATMs in Munich belong to the interbank banking network. So Wikidata doesn't have the location of the ATMs, but OpenStreetMap does. What Wikidata has is the knowledge of which banks belong to which banking network. We can now, in a federated query, and completely online, without writing a single line of code, just with a Sparkle query, combine these two knowledge bases on the fly and display the result as an interactive map in the browser. I think that is pretty cool. Can you do that with the knowledge in your organization? Next query, coming back to our example, here we see the academic genealogy of Lu Jia, her doctoral advisor, their doctoral advisor, and so on, back through the centuries. Again, this is a fully interactive graph. The images come from Wikimedia Commons, the data from Wikidata, and most of these peoples you can read more about in Wikipedia. But let's change the topic. We all know what the elephant in the room is. Large language models. You all have heard and probably used ChatGDP. ChatGDP and other large language models are currently all the hype. Everyone is looking into them. Everyone is working with them. Everyone is asking, given LLMs, do we even still need things such as knowledge graphs? When I was at Google six or seven years ago, I worked on that Google knowledge graph and I was asked the same question. It was pretty... Obviously, this question was coming. Let me take you to the answer that I gave back then. It hasn't changed since then, actually. So, let's ask ChatGDP where Lu Jia was born. ChatGDP doesn't know anything about Lu Jia, and fortunately, it says so. That's actually pretty good. Much better than coming up with a made-up answer, which it does also sometimes. So, that's okay. It doesn't know it. How do you tell it? Well, okay, let's be a bit more generic. Let's ask JGDP a, a more general question. For example, let's hear about famous Chinese female physicists in general. And here we go. We get five answers. The first one is great. Wu Xianjiang. 
The second one, that's not a female. Number three is a great scientist, but she has nothing to do with China. Number four, I, I couldn't find anything about her. There is a person with a slightly similar name, but it seems to be made up from her. Number five is good. So three out of the two, uh, three out of five answers were simply wrong. If you ask me, that's unacceptable. But you know what does work? I can ask ChatGDP to write me a Sparkle query for Wikidata that shows a map of the birthplaces of female Chinese physicists. And ChatGPT complies. It does so out of the box, zero shot training. The query can be directly copy and pasted into the Wikidata query service. And without any changes, it can be used to produce a view of a map of China with the birthplaces highlighted. I get 14 results and all of these are correct. Not just two out of five, but every single one. And that shows us a way how to combine large language models and knowledge graphs. Before we dive deeper into that, let's quickly finish our survey of symbolic data we have available from the Wikimedia projects. Do you remember this query result? It was showing the etymology of the English word water. What's interesting about this is that we don't look at ontological information about water. When does it freeze? What is the chemical composition, etc. But we are looking at the word water, at the English word water. In Wikidata, in addition to the ontological information about things, we also aim to collect data about every word in every language. Here, for example, about the English word water, where you can see the etymological information. And we also have information about its forms. Now in English, nouns are not particularly interesting with regards to forms. They usually only have two forms, a singular and a plural. It's more interesting in some other languages. For example, here in Estonian, where the word Vesi has 36 different forms, according to Wikidata, of which we show six here. Here is the Chinese character uh, word for water, shui, sorry for my pronunciation. We see usage examples, we list senses, there are eight senses for this character in Wikidata, and the senses in turn may connect to the ontological knowledge base. Here we see, for example, that the first sense connects to the items for water and liquid water. So we connect words in many different languages to the senses in the Wikidata knowledge graph, a crucial step for symbolic semantic computation. The lexicographical database started quite a bit later than the ontology database, so it's not as far advanced. As of now, we have more than 1.1 million lexemes or words in Wikidata in more than a thousand languages, spotting more than 12 and a half million different forms and close to 400,000 senses. That's Wikidata, offering an ontological and exographical knowledge graph. Now, let me tell you about our newest project, which I'm very, very excited about. Wikifunctions. Wikifunctions is our first new project since 2012, since Wikidata started, and it is entirely brand new. It just started earlier this month, earlier in August. The project is entirely multilingual, just like Wikidata, but not only in terms of natural languages, but also in terms of programming languages. I'll come to this in a moment. Wikifunctions provides a library of functions that you can use in many different circumstances. But what does it mean? What is a function? So mathematically, a function is a mapping from elements of one set to elements of another set. Now, this might be technically correct, but it usually doesn't explain much. Here's a different explanation. A function is something that takes an input and transforms it predictably into an output following a specific recipe. It is some form of process or calculation or transformation. And if you have something that answers questions, because this answers a question, that's knowledge. 
Functions answer questions, functions are knowledge. And the big tech companies know this. They have been using functions to answer your questions for a while. I can ask Siri how many teaspoons are in two tablespoons. Siri will use a function to calculate the answer. I can ask Bing how tall is the pyramid of the sun and it will answer me with a function looking it up in its knowledge graph, 65 meters. I can ask DuckDuckGo how far the pyramid of the sun is from Mexico City and it will give me the distance and time it takes to drive. Here's one of my favorites. If you go to Google and ask for the volume of a pyramid, you get this beautiful, immersive, interactive experience. It shows the relevant inputs, it shows a diagram, it shows the formula, it substitutes the inputs I enter and it calculates the results. I give the height of 65 meters we just looked up and it will tell us the volume of the pyramid of the sun about 1 million cubic meters. This is beautiful. But we only have these wonderful experiences for the functions that people at the tech companies deem important enough. As soon as we get away from those experiences, like trying to calculate the mass of a pyramid, we're out of luck and it's back to the norm normal search experience. There is no way to create a new function, to share that function with the world, to answer more types of questions to contribute to the world's knowledge on the topics we care about. Functions are questions. Sorry, functions answer questions. Functions are knowledge. And knowledge is power. In fact, I believe functions are a superpower. Because unlike a knowledge graph or a Wikipedia article, they don't just have the answers that are explicit. No, a function can be used to answer a question no one in the world has ever asked before. And you know that they will do so reliably if you trust the function, which is why it is important that they are in the open. Imagine that you can ask a question that no one, that no one ever asked and you can be confident to get the correct answer for that question. That, that is truly amazing. And I really think that it is a superpower we don't want to be granted or taken away by big tech companies. This is why we are building a library of functions that any one of us can edit, that is open and free, that any one of us can contribute to, that any one of us can use. Wiki functions. This is the homepage of Wiki functions. It is a wiki. Anyone can edit the pages of Wiki functions. At least soon we are still ramping up. In Wiki functions, each function is a page of its own. And like in Wikidata, every function gets a persistent identifier. I will take intentionally a super simple example. Boolean negation. It has the identifier Z102. One, six. We can see here a short description for negation, a way to run it, a few aliases. There are only two possible inputs to negation, true, which turns into false, and false, which turns into true. Let's take a look at the details of the function. Most users of Wiki functions won't need to know this, but for function editors, this is crucial. We can see that we have two tests down here. Makes sense, we just said there are two possible input values. We see that all the implementations pass both tests. We have three implementations, one in Python, one in JavaScript, and one in Composition. Let's take a look at those. This is the one in Python. As a programmer, I find this page 
actually really beautiful. We see the tests, we can try out the implementations, etc. There's such this sure is further room for improvement too, but you know, this is a really nice start. Here's JavaScript, it's not much different. Instead of not, we have the exclamation mark operator, but all in all, it's pretty much the same. The interesting one, which is different, is composition. Composition is not a new programming language, but rather it combines existing, usually more basic functions, together to achieve the goal of the given function that we're aiming for. So here, for example, negation is implemented as a simple if statement. If the argument is true, then return false, else return true. Now, one thing about composition is, so it is made up of other functions in the system, and each function can have labels in multiple languages, just as in Wikidata, we can actually read this function in another language, such as Polish here. And not just read, just as in Wikidata, you can also write functions in Polish. For many languages, this will be the first time that you will be able to read and write functions in your language. We have been only around for a few weeks and the community has created about 100 functions so far many of them very simple. Here are a few examples. This one takes a word like wiki and tells us how to spell it in the NATO phonetic alphabet. Whiskey, India, Kilo, India. So this is my daughter's favorite functions. She's nine years old. She loves the fact that she can make the computer say things she wouldn't dare say herself. So she puts in something like dputs, clicks on run function. Here are the examples of functions that generate sentences. This is one major goal of wiki functions, to generate text, to generate natural language, eventually whole Wikipedia articles. With the goal to provide a baseline of knowledge in many more languages that we can today with the goal of maintaining the content of Wikipedia only once. That's what we are building towards. We call this abstract Wikipedia. To summarize, we aim to allow all people, even without English language skills, to use functions, to create functions, to implement functions. We think that there is a large pool of potential contributors who have all the skills necessary to contribute functions but don't speak English. We hope to unlock that potential. We hope that wiki functions will lead to the creation of a comprehensive library of natural language generation functions for 300 and more natural languages. This will be a major stepping stone towards abstract Wikipedia. And we really want for wiki functions to allow everyone to access functions. Today, programmers have easy access to all kinds of functions, but others only to whatever big tech companies allow us to have. With wiki functions, we want to expand the usage and also the creation of functions to enable many more questions to be answered, to enable to create functions for the topics we care about. And not just for people, but also for large language models and other systems. Because today, large language models are not necessarily great at maths or doing things that require functions. For example, here I ask for the prime factor of 12,321 and it tells me it's 3 and 41 with much authority. So 3 squared and 41 squared together is 12,321. Alas, it's not. <laughs> it's 15,129 if I take 3 squared and four, times 41 squared. It's not very good at math usually. 
and I mean, the developers of LLMs know that, and we already see experimentations in that area. Here is Google Bard being asked to translate 7.23 miles into kilometers. And you can actually see, and it tells you, that it's taking a function implemented in Python to do that calculation. So instead of, you know, the LLM doing the actual transformation into the, into the different value, the conversion, it takes a Python script or maybe even creates a Python script and calls it and gets the result then back from the Python script. We have that very function already in the wiki functions better. You can already translate miles to kilometers. A catalog of functions would expand the capabilities of large language models considerably. Especially a catalog of functions that also has access to a large knowledge graph. What wiki functions will do with Wikidata. Knowledge graphs and semantic computing bring a number of strengths to the table, which are very complementary to the strengths of large language models. Knowledge graphs can be easily edited and understood. They can be queried. They are inexpensive and fast to run. They can provide extensive coverage, as we have seen with Lucia Jia. It is trivial to add more entities to Wikidata as the world evolves. And the answers are usually correct. And if they're not, they're easy to fix and they will remain fixed. You know that you have fixed it and you know that it's good now. But they also have significant disadvantages. For starters, they are brittle. If your question doesn't exactly fit with the ontology of the knowledge graph or the function, you don't get an answer at all. But also, there are not enough experts, experts around to implement knowledge graphs when they are needed. Knowledge graphs are also certainly, they're not hip. They're not something that is currently hot or interesting. It's not the technology that generates a lot of interest right now. Now, let's look at the advantages of large language models. First, they can deal with human language at a level that just a few years ago, I would have thought it's still a decade away or more. This is truly amazing. I mean, I'm constantly surprised and um, deeply amazed by how how large language models deal with natural language. It's, it's wonderful. They're also very resilient, meaning that they're not brittle. They answer confidently, even if you don't have a clue what the answer should be. They understand a wide range of ways you can phrase your question and they can build answers for that. It's, it's, it's beautiful. This is really changing the paradigm of computing entirely. They also have an incredible performance on popular topics on the head, but they don't cover the rest very well, as we have seen. And they currently have a huge amount of mindshare. Everyone is talking about it. Everyone is thinking about large language models, which also means that they are going to develop rapidly in the coming months and years. But it is a new technology and they still have a tons of problems. Some of them will likely be solved in the coming months and years, especially given how much investment is going into these technologies. But some of these problems are fundamental and are unsolvable. First of all, as we have seen throughout the talk, they just like to hallucinate, to come up with answers that are plain wrong. That's bad. Then they have an incredible hunger for really hard to get hardware. The chips and the RAM you need is expensive and has very limited availability. 
LLMs are still not very well understood. We cannot predict when they will work and when they won't. This is terrible from a product perspective and a, and a development perspective. And they are basically impossible to update reliably if the world changes or to fix errors if something is wrong. I don't know about you, but if I cannot fix an error in my production system, that's embarrassing. And unlike with knowledge graphs, there are a lot of experts out there, but the competition for them is burning hot. They are expensive, they are hard to get, they are massively coveted. Also, large man language models are super expensive to train and run. My estimate is that it's about 50 times as expensive to run a large knowledge model for question answering than it is to use a knowledge graph. But don't take my word for it. Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, the company making JetGDB, described the compute cost of JetGDB as eye-watering. And don't forget, he made a really sweet deal with Microsoft about running it on Azure, and he got billions of dollars for that. John Hennessy, he is the chairman of Google, and he's a former computer science professor in Stanford, so he really knows what he's talking about, said that running a chat GDP like Google would be 10 times more expensive. 10x is a lot for costs, for your running costs. And they're just talking about the inference cost of running those systems to answer questions. Each of these models also need to be trained. And current state-of-the-art language models cost millions of dollars to train. For, G for GPT-4, the cost was given with more than four, more than a hundred million dollars. Good news is you probably don't have to do it. You probably don't have to train your own model, but can hopefully use an existing open source model that you can fine tune for your tasks. That will be considerably cheaper to train, but again, not for inference, not for running those systems. The 10X for running the model still remains and has to. This is a fundamental issue. If you think about it, it's not surprising. Natural language queries will always be like several words or tokens of input and produce several tokens of output. In the case of GPT-3, the smaller outdated model, every single token runs through 96 layers, branching out to 175 billion weights, multiplying matrices, soft maxing results. Where is in Wikidata? We look up an item out of 100 million and find a key out of 10,000. Those are logarithmic operations. The costs have to be at least an order of magnitude different, probably more, just for running the system. For training, I always remember what my former manager at Google, Jamie Taylor, one of the architects of the Google Knowledge Graph has said. You can machine learn Obama's birthplace every time you need it, but that costs a lot of money and you're never sure it is correct. You can take a text, read it every time and answer. Or you can just use a knowledge graph and look it up and be sure that the answer is correct. I think the answer, the key to the future really is in so-called augmented language models. Toolform being a particularly well-known example. Or for JetGDP, that's what JetGDP plugins are there for. The idea is that we can enrich language models with additional systems which are good and efficient at specific tasks, such as math or other functions from wiki functions, or looking up facts or query results in a knowledge graph, such as Wikidata. I mean, given that ChatGDP already can, zero shot, create Sparkle queries against Wikidata, there isn't that much left to do to make them work together. And not only can we connect LLMs to a knowledge graph, 
but also to a repository of functions, such as wiki functions, to calculate things, to do transformations on strings, to do calculations on geo-coordinates, on dates, etc. Both knowledge graphs and functions are tools that LLMs will learn to use. And the LLM will be the interface between the human and the knowledge graph and the semantic computing system. In a world where models can generate infinite content, knowledge becomes valuable. And that's what Jamie Taylor's rule means. We don't want to machine learn Obama's place of birth every time we need it. We want to store it once and for all, and that's what knowledge graphs are good at. They keep your valuable knowledge safe and easily accessible and reliable. I am of the strict belief that there is no good reason to ever again manually enter or learn the date of birth of Lu Shijia. We have it in Wikidata and that's it. The knowledge graph provides you with the ground truth for your language models. The knowledge that you available through Wikidata is both valuable and a public good. By the way, the other way around is also true. Large language models are an amazing tool to speed up the creation of knowledge graphs. They are probably the best new tool for knowledge extraction we have seen in a decade or two. The future of knowledge graphs and semantic computing is brighter than ever, especially thanks to a world that has language models in it. Thank you so much for your attention and thank you for the opportunity to talk to you.